Well, what I want to deal with is what is the U.S.'s problem with the Democratic People's Republic of Korea? Uh, because I think everybody realizes the U.S. has a big problem with the DPRK. I mean, you don't, you could be 10 years old and you would have absorbed some of the hostility towards the DPRK if you, you know, if you watch TV or if it's even part of the culture. If somebody like De Dennis Rodman, you know, a sports celebrity, goes to the DPRK and acts friendly towards that country and its leadership, he's raked over the coals in the media here. That's just one example of the constant uh, propaganda uh, efforts against the DPRK. And I think, you know, almost every week you'll see something in the, in the media that is attacking the DPRK. So what is this, what is their problem? Of course, they frame it around a couple of uh, issues at the moment. Um, it's framed as a problem that the DPRK has developed a, a nuclear capability with a, couple, with a few nuclear weapons. Um, you know, just to harp on that is a really pretty ridiculous when you consider that the U.S. has enough nuclear weapons to blow up the whole world many times over has the predominant uh, nuclear grip on the world of, for the whole, of all countries in, everywhere. And as the DPRK themselves point out, in terms of the nuclear testing, they have tested two weapons. There's been more than 100 nuclear tests. You never hear about them. But if the DPRK has a nuclear test, it's headlines. Okay, so I think for people who are attending this forum this weekend, it should be clear that this is not the real reason. Um, Israel, for example, does not acknowledge that it has nuclear weapons. But uh, it's if you look at the, something like James, which is this British-based, uh, 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 yeah, right, it's a, it's a military think tank sort of place that's supposed to put out um, uh, information about the militaries of all countries around the world. They estimate that uh, Israel has a couple of dozen nuclear weapons, um, but the no, but it's never raised here. That, you know, they didn't sign the IAEA agreement, or they didn't you know commit themselves. Of course, the U.S. is not a signer either, by the way, uh, <laughs> which we should all remember. So this is this is a this is a phony issue, the, uh, and I'll get to the question of Korea's right to defend itself uh, a little bit later. Um, the other thing that they constantly use against the DPRK is to say that the DPRK doesn't care about human rights, it doesn't care about its own people, um, it's, uh, there's a terrible repression, but they allow the people, they're letting the people starve. Um, let's, first of all, let's look at what, what, where the U.S. stands on some of these issues, you know. The United States has the biggest prison population in the world. More, two and a half million people actually behind bars. Some seven million people caught up in what's called the justice system, which is the injustice system. People are tortured in prison. Uh, it, it's not, you know, it, you know, you're not in prison you know, in some nice little, like being in a motel somewhere. Conditions are terrible, especially in the southern prison. Um, but, but also, you know, right here on Rikers Island. So. You know, for the U.S. to be lecturing the, the world about prisoners, you know, physician heal thyself. You know. um, but also in the United States, where the U.S. has some of the most repressive anti-labor laws in the world, the repression of workers here is very extreme. Um, the police can be called out against uh, worker demonstrations. Uh, I, I think. People recently uh, had a march from Baltimore to D.C. where they stopped uh, at a Walmart. It was practically surrounded by police uh, defending Walmart against a, uh, a, a demonstration that was pointing out how the Walmart workers are so uh, uh, exploited by the, the Walmart bo bosses. Um, so, and, and then there, you know, you hear the argument that. Uh, um, the, oh, oh, another point I want to make on repression in the United States. The U.S. military, as we know from 
flux, so many recent uh, exploits, has forever allowed a high level of violence against women in the military. Actually, women, in, not even to speak of the women who are in areas where the U.S. military is sent to, as, a, as conquerors, but within the U.S. military itself. A very high level of violence against women, sexual abuse, and against gays. So, you know, where's the U.S. right to lecture other countries on, uh, on human rights? And on the question of food, Korea, North Korea is a far northern country. Uh, it's part, it's only half of, the, of Korea. Uh, a, a, a distinct people with a distinct language and history for the last 5,000 years, which has been divided for half a century, more than half a century now. Um, and so being a far northern country and also very much more mountainous than the south, this is a mountainous country too, but nothing like the north. It was natural that a lot of the food source for the people living in the north came from the south before the division of Korea. So once the U.S. set up a, a demilitarized zone that just was like a scar across the center of Korea separating the north from the south, the north had, had a food problem that had to be resolved either through importing food from other countries or trying you know, to use every way to increase their own uh, productive capacity in agriculture. And there have been very rough periods, especially after natural disasters, and especially after their trade with the Soviet Union evaporated because of uh, the, uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union. So, you know, they have had rough uh, times. But if the U.S. really cared about the people of the DPRK, why would they hype, you know, demand tougher economic sanctions on the DPRK at a time when the DPRK would need to have, be able to trade with the rest of the world, to be able to buy uh, agricultural products from other countries that they could, could not produce themselves. It's total hypocrisy on the part of U.S. imperialism to, you know, to, on the one hand, cry, uh, shed crocodile tears about people of the DPRK not not getting enough food, and then on the other hand, try to destroy the economy of the DPRK. So this is my point, that these are phony arguments. And what they are meant to do is to create a, a hostility to the DPRK here among the population, which is really coming from the ruling class of the US, which is against the DPRK for one reason, and that is that it had an an incredible revolution. At the same time that revolutions were sweeping the rest of Asia in the 40s and 50s, uh, it had an incredible revolution, and the North was able to retain the, 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 what the people wanted, whereas the, the South was occupied by U.S. troops at the end of World War II. And in the North, there was an indigenous movement uh, that uh, had had grown out of the struggle against uh, Japanese colonialism that uh, then became uh, a popular movement throughout uh, Korea at the time when uh, the World War II ended. And there began to be people's committees all over Korea to get rid of the class in power which had collaborated with Japanese imperialism and was hated. In addition to being landlords and, you know, merchants who, who uh, exploited and oppressed the people, they had also become agents of a foreign power. Uh, they, they worked for the Japanese imperialists, a lot of them. So there was an indigenous, nationalist, and increasingly socialist communist movement in Korea to get rid of the imperialists and set up and change society. And they succeeded to do that in the uh, and but not in the South, because the U.S. occupied the South at the end of the war, they rushed troops to South Korea uh, as, as they could see that the old regimes were crumbling around uh, Europe, uh, around Asia at that time because of the crisis for the colonial powers. Uh, there had been this tremendous war, there was growing resistance, there was resistance in, in, uh, in China, there was resistance in the Philippines, there was resistance in Indonesia.
Asia, uh, and of course in China itself, and in Korea. And so they were in a crisis. So this, this is the real reason for the hostility to the that, that the that this mass struggle that took place in Korea has survived in the North to this day. And you have a socialist government in North Korea. And the US has never been able to uh, accept that. Um, the, of course, the height of the hostility was seen when the US actually invaded Korea in the 1950s with millions, millions of troops. I mean, there were something like more than five and a half million US troops that were sent to Korea during the Korean War in 1950 and 52. And the objective was to destroy the, the revolutionary government in the North. Um, but they didn't succeed. This was, you cannot imagine what a humiliation this was for US imperialism not to be able to succeed against the, uh, and bring down this revolutionary government. Uh, the, it, it had never happened before. The US had always succeeded in their military aggressions around the world. And they did not succeed against the PPRK. The war ended with a, that, with a line drawn at the same place that had been drawn beforehand. Uh, and in the meantime, uh, they suffered such humiliations such as Major uh, G uh, General Dean being uh, uh, forced to make a retreat that was the longest retreat ever by uh, U U.S. forces in any war. Um, later on, the, after the war was over, the, the uh, North Koreans captured a U.S. spy ship called the Pueblo and uh, actually got a confession from the they held the crew for a year. They got a confession from the head of the crew, not through torture, not through anything like that, but really through their persistence in not giving them up until the U.S. would apologize. So the U.S., you know, the U.S. ruling class has a particularly uh, a particular thing against the DPRK because of the DPRK's strength against them and holding on all this time. Um, I want to see if I can't sort of leap ahead so I see my views up close to my time. Um, now, we should say, you know, to, to, to show that at the time of the Korean War, there was a socialist camp. And they had the support of both the Soviet Union and China. And that was extremely important extremely important. They won it, they won, you know, the, the end of the war, largely through their own efforts, but it was in, it was at a time when U.S. imperialism had to deal with the fact that there was a socialist camp in the world that was powerful. But we're in a new world situation now, and so we have to look at the heightened uh, aggression against the DPRK in the light of this new world situation. First of all, we should, you know, we should put it in the context of this capitalist crisis that is occurring from Europe to the United States and, you know, everywhere uh, in between. When there's a capitalist crisis, not only in, is the uh, our conditions for the masses of the capitalist countries made much worse, including in the most imperialist of the countries, but there's an intensified competition to control markets that goes on. And it intensifies the, the, the aggressive policies of the governments. And so the US really has been on a campaign ever since it, you know, was able to succeed with tearing down the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe uh, as countries that had, to a, to a large degree, uh, planned economies, they, they destroyed that, they pulled it. Um, but ever since then, they have been on a, 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 a campaign, really, to turn back what, what was achieved during the period of the national liberation struggles and the existence of a socialist um, And that uh, has a lot to do, I think, with this heightened aggression against the 
here, which we're seeing now, not only in propaganda, yes, propaganda, but in actual enormous military moves. Uh, Fred talked about uh, the uh, way in which the U.S. is reorienting its whole military strategy now is to reorient and move enormous amount of uh, naval uh, uh, capacity, particularly into Asia, but also the the missile systems and so on, anti missile systems. So an anti missile system means you attack and people cannot respond to you because you can you can take out their response with your anti missile system. That's what it is. An anti missile system is supposed to be defensive, but it's really part of an aggressive strategy. Um, so this a lot of this has been directed in the immediate sense against the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. Uh, although the implications for China are, are, are all a part of this bigger picture. So when the DPRK has been faced with how they're going to allocate their resources in this period of heightened U.S. Uh, antagonism toward them, they've had to make difficult decisions uh, in terms of where they're going to put their um, uh, resources. Um, and they have called it, in this most recent day, eight years or so, a, a military first strategy. Because they have seen what happened to countries that the U.S. wanted to destroy and take over. And, and where they did not have a, prop, a proper defense, uh, they, were, they have been overrun. Libya, uh, Iraq which was supposed to have weapons of mass destruction and did not. And the U.S. knew that, but they made it up anyway. Uh, Yugoslavia before that, the DPR saw that, the DPRK saw that, and they decided that they would put a great deal of their resources into this defense. And that's the meaning of their nuclear strategy. And uh, also, it's one of the reasons why they haven't been able to put as much of their national resources to, to, to developing the uh, uh, the industry industry and agriculture for the people as they would want to do. Um, so this is this forum this weekend is a meeting of people from around the country who consider themselves leftists, and I I think it's really important that there be voices raised at this meeting in defense of the Democratic People's Republic of Korea against what the U.S. is attempting to do at the present time, and to try and think of ways, all of us, that we can go back to our communities and whatever kind of work we're doing, try to bring up the question and explain to people and educate people on the need to be in solidarity with the Democratic People's Republic of Korea against what is a very dangerous and hostile uh, perspective and strategy on the part of the U.S. Republican gender. Speaker, I think you all were here for what I said before. But what I uh, would like to add, I, had, I didn't talk at all about South Korea. Um, and I've been to both North and South Korea, so has Monica. And uh, in the U.S. in developing their strategy towards Korea, of course they have to take into account the tremendous militant unity that exists in the North. But they also have to take into consideration the population in the South and how they would react to more overt, you know, attacks on the DPRK. And uh, there is a, a lot, I mean, they, they, you know, they don't admit this, but there is a lot of sentiment in the South that's very favorable to the DPRK. In, in fact, the official position of the South Korean government has to be, it always has had to be, that they are for reunification of Korea. They can't not say that. You know, millions of families were torn apart by the, say, by the division of the country. And they, the people really want unification. Now, for a long time, and during the period, you know, when the uh, uh, DPRK was actually ahead of the South in their economic development, especially around the 60s, maybe the early part of the 70s, um, the South was uh, under a military dictatorship, the, uh, the, the dictatorship of Syngman Lee, and then he was followed by uh, uh, General Park, 
and it's, it's General Park's daughter, who's now the head of state in South Korea. So that shows you how, you know, with the U.S. behind them, how they, uh, how reactionary the, the, the ruling forces in South Korea are. Um, I just want to tell you a couple of experiences I had uh, in South Korea. Um, I was there uh, when there was a, a more open period, a more liberal period, and there was actually you know, some progress made and uh, um, exchanges of people and things between the North and the South. And what that did was it, it sort of, it was like taking the lid off of a pressure cooker because all kinds of things just came bubbling to the surface. Uh, uh, there was, uh, committees got formed to um, document the crimes of the U.S. forces in South Korea during the war. At that time, the stories began to come out about how people who were actually just fleeing and had been told to wear white by the government, you know, by the U.S., that if they, they were fleeing the fighting during the war and, and heading further south to get away from the fighting. And they were uh, strafed and killed by U.S. pilots during, during that period. And, and, and then there were people tortured and imprisoned and so on. And all this was like coming up, bubbling up at that time. But also the, the, the anger at the working conditions in the South, because a lot, you know, there's been a lot of economic development in the South, and it was the strategy of U.S. imperialism, really, to rebuild the economies of Japan and South Korea, in, in, uh, especially in the period of the 60s, uh, because they could see that, the, you know, if, if, it, if the conditions remained as bad as they had been, there would be a struggle that would break out into a, in a revolutionary direction. So they opened up the market in the United States to say to the Japanese auto market makers, then to the Korean automakers. You know, it also gave them a chance to invest in those companies too. U.S. companies invested in, in those companies in order to get labor cheaper. But that was just one side. The other side was an actual political strategy to rebuild these economies on a capitalist basis in the struggle uh, against a competing social system. So that finally South Korea, you know, became much more developed. Um, but uh, anyway, I met uh, some, some workers, uh, very young, um, who, uh, uh, had, uh, who, who had a meeting in a, a, a YMCA, actually, <laughs> that I attended while I was there. And we, we socialized afterwards, and one of, one of the young men fell asleep at, right at the table. And the uh, other the young woman said, oh, please don't mind. And he's, he's, just, he's just been working 14-hour days, six, six days a week, 14-hour days. That was the working conditions in South Korea about, it was about 10 years ago. And the other thing I wanted to tell you was, that in terms of the sentiment of the people towards the US occupation, I spoke at a rally in Gwangju, which is in the southern part of South Korea. And it's where uh, there had been a student uprising um, in the uh, 70s that was brutally suppressed. Uh, I think several thousand young people were killed by the military at a time when the US had, and still does, have the ultimate command decision making in its hands. Um, and uh, there was this rally of about 20,000 people, you know, very progressive. Um, and there was a, uh, uh, there were, you know, the, the, the older people are, are very more formally dressed, you know, quite formal. The younger people were kind of punk, and there was like a punk rock band at this rally, and uh, everybody was, you know, attacking the U.S. U.S. for what it was doing in South Korea. And this punk rock band got up, and they were playing, and they were singing in Korean. Of course, I couldn't understand the Korean part of the, what they were saying. But then they would come to the refrain, which was in English. And then they would say, fuck the USA! <laughs> fuck these, and all these nice, big looking older people. <laughs> so give you a, another view of what's go, been going on in South Korea, that you know, it, uh, there's been a very heavy repressive win. The national security law in South Korea, if you have a postcard showing the beautiful city of Pyongyang, North Carolina, North Korea, which uh, uh, Monica described, if you have a postcard, 
You are under the national security law. You can go to jail. Mm -hmm. That's right. That, and those laws have not been repealed. Even in the more liberal period, they were not repealed. But under that heavy weight of oppression, there's a very strong sentiment that would break out, I'm sure, in any case, in any hostilities. So the U.S. has to keep that in mind when they deal with the uh, I just want to add something. You take the mic.